So good afternoon. Welcome to session two of our North Dakota um, 1915 I Services Medicaid Academy. We're going to be talking about participant enrollment. So if you're in the wrong Zoom, log off. <laughs> Otherwise, listen up for more. <laughs> and so we're going to talk about who should actually well, we'll tell you who we are first, right? In case you haven't seen this before, maybe this is your first session. Um, so, Marcella, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. I'm Marcella McGuire. I lead CSH's Health and Housing Work Nationwide. I'm based out of Philadelphia. Um, and I've had the privilege of working with the good people of North, good people from North Dakota for the last four or five years. It's been evolving your benefit. So I'm working with your Medicaid office and, and behavioral health offices as well. So thank you. Thank you. Sabrina? Yeah, so the person who's been talking to you, <laughs> her name is Ambrosia Crump. I'm a senior program manager with CSH. Um, my background is both in the housing space and as a behavioral health care provider. I'm newer to CSH, but so excited to be part of this process for your agencies to either transition to this new um, 1959 service or to maybe to um, build Medicaid for the first time. So glad to be a support and resource to you through this process here. Um, and we talked about who should be here, right? So first of all, you should be hopefully in North Dakota and wanting to learn about Medicaid. But specifically, um, we wanna make sure that your team hopefully includes your executive lead. So folks who are the deciders in the organization who can make those um, changes from a policy level or even um, um, practice level too. So that's why we also have program lead for folks who are um, serving as the people maybe on the ground who are either supporting program staff, maybe sometimes even working with clients directly. Um, but these are the folks that should be at this session today. So if you have those people on your team, message them now, tell them to log on um, because they um, will likely benefit the most from this particular area. So you may remember this from last week, and we're just wanting to reinforce this again, that DHS, Monica and Jennifer are on the call with us, um, but DHS, DHS provides the policy requirements. They're the, that's the what behind this um, process. We as the TA um, team is really most able to help you with the how, right? We can't really make any recommendations or even any changes to the policy itself. Um, we're just really here to support you on how to um, onboard this service and maybe even work through some of the kinks in order for that to happen for you. Um, and again, through, throughout each session, we're going to make sure that we talk through some of the tools that we're going to be providing as a team, helpful tips. Um, we want to hear from you guys, the so opportunities to share. Every, every agency has a varying levels of experience, right? And some of you guys are our best resource to help um, educate. Um, we, we really value that. So we want to hear from you too. Definitely Part of this should be dialogue and not just monologuing towards you. We want to leverage some of those best practices, some of those resources or skills or tools that you know that have worked for you so far for agencies who are further along in this process. And then for those who need and could benefit from it, there will be some coaching for, each, um, for agencies who need that. Um, thankful for most of you, you've already done our um, provider assessment survey um, that helps to inform the TA that can be potentially offered to your organization that can be specific to your needs. Um, if you haven't already, please do that and we can, uh, I'll drop that in the link later on so that we can follow up and do that if we haven't had that opportunity. So again, we are doing services participant for this session. The tool that is related to that today is our participant eligibility tracker tool. Um, that you will be provided. I'm hopefully, hopefully you did get emails from me with slides, with tools, um, and also um, to follow will be postings on the state website on their respect to 1959 services page with our recordings, with our, our PowerPoint copies, as well as any tools or resources that are pertinent for this. Um, so look out for emails from me, but it, um, also know that this um, will be living on that site so that you can reference, rewatch, um, utilize as needed. And we're excited to have that here for you. So again, we're revisiting um, what is the lens that we are looking at um, integrating maybe Medicaid into our agencies for the first time or pivoting or expanding to this particular service? What should we know programmatically that needs to shift for us if this is going to change for us? Um, we talked about this last week, but just, just reminding us what lens maybe we're going to be approaching things and what we need to consider in order to be successful in a transition like this. So programmatically, um, what are we adding to our services or maybe enhancing? What staff or training should they have, expertise or credentials should they have to, for any respective services that we're going to be offering, right? 
And um, strategically, if, if it's not us, then who can do that around us? Do we need to create MOUs, business partnerships? Is someone else going to help us with our billing now? Because maybe we don't have that in-house. Um, and thinking about long-term planning, um, what happens when there's um, delays or maybe some changes in policy or um, um, delays in just payment, right? Sometimes that happens realistically with Medicaid um, and, and reimbursement, and we'll talk more a little bit about that too, but just thinking from a higher level um, purview, what can I do to diversify my funding or just plan for those things, planning for ramp up, even if this is something new for us. Um, and then analytical, we need to know, um, are we doing the work well? Are we meeting the metrics that we need to meet and to ensure that we can continue on this path? Um, what are we doing to collect our data and house that safely? Um, and what are we doing about um, quality assurance to make sure as we go along um, that we are doing, again, what we intend to do in this work and that that's reflected um, when we're pursuing even other funding resources or streams. So we're going to continue um, for sustainability purposes. And then logistics, how are we going to manage um, documentation? Are we, do we have the right policies in place? Um, what, what resources are we using for financial, for legal agreements, um, HR, do we have that? Do we need to um, outsource that? Do we need to learn how to do that ourselves? Um, all of the things that go along with becoming a Medicaid provider from all these different lenses of focus. I don't know, did I leave anything out, Marcella, you'd like to add to that? You're good. Okay, okay, okay. So again, I just mentioned earlier that we will be having the resources po um, posted on the um, state website. Um, and, and the tool, again, for today is our participant eligibility tracker tool. Again, it's, nothing's required. I don't want anyone to get stressed out. Really, the participant eligibility tracker is simply a, a Excel spreadsheet, and the intent is for you to know the status for your um, clients or um, tenants, whatever program you have, as far as their Medicaid eligibility, where they are with that, how long um, authorization is for, little details like that um, so that you can literally track where they stand. And so you can choose to use this tool if you want to when we give that to you later. You may have your own. You can integrate or embed some of the me um, measurements into an existing tool. So again, it's just a resource for you guys. Don't stress out, but it's meant to help, not to, to give you more burden, but it will help with making sure to optimize that um, reimbursement for yourself so that things don't fall through the cracks when we're not used to tracking some of these different elements that we're going to be talking more about. We will be turning this over to Marcella. All right. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to talk about, so start with the foundation here is the eligibility criteria for the services. Um, and there's a number of different aspects of those eligibility services, and we're going to talk about these here. This is all written out in the state plan amendment, um, which is something that the state negotiated with the federal government and said, we want to offer these services, we want it to these people, et cetera, in a, in a um, in that process. So this is all laid out in the state plan amendment and we've got the snapshot of that state plan amendment, the link there. One, a person has to be Medicaid eligible when enrolled. So they have to have to be, excuse me, they have to be Medicaid enrolled. So they can be what in North Dakota is called traditional Medicaid. That's pregnant and parenting women. That's people who are aged, blind and disabled. That's low income seniors, et cetera. They can be Medicaid expansion, meaning they are low income, they are between the they are under age 65, and they don't have any other disabilities, they haven't proved any other disabilities or challenges to the state at this time. That's the expansion population. Making the distinction here is really important because when you're sending in your claims, what otherwise known as a bill, you're going to send it to different places depending upon whether your people are traditional Medicaid or Medicaid expansion. These are behavioral health related services. These are just for people with behavioral health related services. The state plan amendment has, I think, seven or eight different pages of these are the qualifying diagnoses. So part of eligibility determination is making sure that someone has been certified to have the, one of the qualifying diagnoses. And then folks have to be assessed. Uh, North Dakota has chosen to use the World Health Organization's Disability Assessment Scale, otherwise known as the HUDAS. Uh, they have a score of 20, people have to score 25 or higher. There's lots of people with behavioral health challenges that don't need special in-home services in order to be able to remain in the integrated and the most community um, 
most community integrated setting possible. Um, so this is just for people who have these other, what Medicaid commonly calls functional limitations. They have trouble doing the same th the things we do every day. They have trouble with the budget. They have trouble managing their medications. They can't navigate their benefits. They need peer supports, all kinds of different opportunities. And that HUDAS score says, yep, yeah, this is a person with a high enough level of functional impairment. It's what we call that they're gonna need these special in-home services. There are a number of different age qualifications. There's supportive education services that are for younger people, the supportive employment services that are for older people. Um, so there's some age qualifications for each of these services as well. So just be aware of that. And that's all covered in the snapshot. When you think about who it is that you're going to serve, who you want to serve with your agency, you're thinking about all of these different eligibility pieces. This is an, this is an and, not an or. So if I'm traditional Medicaid, but I don't have a behavioral health diagnosis, or I don't have a high enough food up score, I'm not eligible. I have to have both the Medicaid enrollment, I have to have the qualified behavioral health diagnosis, and I have to have the assessment on the WHODAS that says a person qualifies at 25 or higher. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna get into deep into the one service that we over at CSH know the best is um, looking at some of those others. We could do one of these slides for every single other service, but this is just one example to say, so you've got your top three lists, the same things on the last slide, traditional Medicaid, and then for um, housing services, there's homeless related, you have to be homeless, at risk of homeless, living in a higher level of care that's required or at risk for institutionalization. So you don't have to have, to get the housing services, you don't have to have just the top three, you have to have the two others. And then also six months prior to a person's 18th birthday. Um, so if you're looking for what other services you're, look, you're looking here to offer uh, benefits navigation, peer support, the snapshot will take you through, are there any additional services? Those first top three are for all of the services in the 1915I. Some of the other services have additional services. Care coordination also is just those top three. Because care coordination, we really think of as the door to all of the other services. A person is approved for services, we'll talk about that. A person is assigned to a care coordination agency. The care coordination agency does the person-centered plan that says, gosh, what does Marcella or whomever need in order to remain in the community? We're gonna make sure she has the right package of services. Very few people need all 12 services and the benefit of people may need a few. So it's good to know what the eligibility criteria are for the specific services that you're offering. Next slide, please. So what's the process? I always like this slide because it tells me, okay, what are all the different steps? Who does those different steps? These uh, color coordination here is um, very, is, is intentional here. Let's take you all through the steps so you know where you're going and then we'll start to unpack each of the steps because the steps can be complicated. Orange is work that the human services zones do. Uh, people may have supports in order to help them get to the human services zone and help them support them through the human services zone process, but these are functions of the human services zones. One, they do Medicaid eligibility determination. They take the paperwork that says this person is low income enough, this person has a disability, this person is the right age, they're eligible for Medicaid, we should enroll them in Medicaid, and that's what the human services zone do. There's income documentation needed there. Um, as well as if you're trying to approve, say, a disability or something, you may need other documentation there as well. Once a person has been through the enrollment process, what I'm told is that for the bigger sites, for Fargo, for Bismarck, you may have one worker who does the eligibility determination, and then you have another worker who works on elig benefit eligibility determination. Um, in the small and more rural communities, you may have one, one or two workers who do all of these different pieces as well. So someone's determined to be Medicaid eligible, human services zones Medicaid enrolled. Then they move to the eligibility determination. This is where you need a HUDAS, um, you need a uh, diagnostic report, um, and it's really important to get that Medicaid eligibility piece uh, first because um, that allows you to get these other assessments and these other documentations done. Most doctors won't see people if they're not insured. Health centers may be an exa one example where that's not the case, but you can get people to have the diagnostic report, the behavioral health services, behavioral health diagnosis there, um, and then any other requirements, such as the proof of homelessness or housing instability for housing supports. Um, when they're determined eligible for 1915I, the zone will then get the potential participant and anyone who's working with them or supporting them a list of active care coordinators. What agencies are doing care coordination in the state? 
It's the individual, their family, and their supports that begins to work and determine and work with the care coordination. Uh, the state has a great website that says these are all the agencies that are filled with care, uh, that do care coordination. It tells you what counties they operate in, and you try to, um, and folks try to connect to the people in the counties in which they live in. Um, this is also part of why provider enrollment happens, the way that the state is able to build this wonderful, helpful website that says, here's who's doing care coordination is because all of those agencies have gone through the provider enrollment process. And so now they can list that on the website. Choice is a fundamental value in Medicaid. Um, so as much as possible, we're trying to make, uh, the state's trying to be sure that there is choice of provider um, and choice of services. These are all voluntary related services. So now the zone's job is done. We switch from the orange to the purple because at that point it becomes the care coordination agency. Um, the care coordination agency um, will be doing the assessment. They will be doing the person-centered plan. They develop that plan. And then they look at, okay, of the, I believe it's 12, 1959 services, this is the service mix, the service package uh, that this individual needs in order to be successful living in the community. Then they will move into the process of and who offers those services um, nearby to be able to assist the individual. So the care coordination agency um, develops the person-centered plan. Then they make the referrals in order to those who deliver the direct care services beyond care coordination. This is also a place where it's important to mention the conflict of interest. There are five counties in uh, North Dakota where the purple and the yellow, I mean, purple and the green need to stay separate, meaning the care coordination agency can't be the service provider, et cetera. But all of the other counties, the more rural counties, that is not required as well. Um, and I think we may have a map coming up that tells you there. Next slide, please. So this is the whole process. Now, we'll, get to, we'll get to the map. Um, but if you can't wait to see the map, just Google North Dakota rural provider shortage area and you will, I promise you, you will find the map. I've Googled it many times. So as we said, it all starts with the zones. Here's a map of the North Dakota Human Services zones. There are stars for this. This is a state website. As Ambrosia said, you're going to get all the slides. So if you want to see what's the Human Services zone that's closest to me, highly recommend you reach out to the Human Services zones and just build those relationships, build those connections. Whatever services on the I you're trying to offer, just let them know you're here. As a provider enrollment, you'll be going onto the state website. People will do that. But help understand, we're hearing very different things across the state from how much the zones are, are aware of this and understanding of this. Zones are having trouble staffing just like everybody else is having trouble staffing. So it's always good to have that personal touch and make sure you're connected to folks. Um, if you're trying to help somebody navigate the participant eligibility process or you've got a family member or friend, someone at your church or community that's doing this, this is also, I think, just a really helpful map to know where people should be going to get help. So it starts with the zones. As we said, that's the orange. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, yeah, just reinforcing um, what Marcella said, you will be um, directing your client, your participant to those zones, and but it's still important to know which clients you're going to be diverting to them to see if they are appropriate for Medicaid eligibility. Luckily, in North Dakota, we're they're pretty expansive in the eligibility. You have to be low income or not, and also have no health care coverage, be 65 or older, receiving at least a dollar from SSI. Um, or having that Medicare coverage. Um, so I'm hoping that a vast majority of your folks are eligible, but it's important to know the eligibility criteria for Medicaid. Um, once you guys have completed your organizational or provider enrollment, you should have access to the ADRS system and you would, should be able to check to see if your respective um, client um, participant is already enrolled in Medicaid. And that's gonna be very important. Um, so hopefully at that stage, you've already, when you're doing all of this, you're already in the system yourself and you'll have that access to do that, um, whether they have the traditional Medicaid or Medicaid expansion. Um, and so here, link, you'll see that you'll have access to the site and um, web link here. Um, so individuals can apply online. Um, there's forms that they can um, download, complete and submit by either mail, fax or email um, or go to the zone for that direct assistance, right? Um, there may be people who are above 150% who may be categor categorically eligible for Medicaid, but not necessarily eligible for the 1915I services. And we did link um, the federal poverty level chart so you can see um, whether or not um, 
they are also potentially eligible for 1915I. So it's important to make that distinction because you may see folks who are enrolled in Medicaid and receiving it, but again, as Marcella went through that criteria, um, there is specific criteria for 1915I related services. Um, and like Marcella already mentioned too, depending on the zone and the assignments there for um, actual practice, the person doing the Medicaid eligibility may or may not be the same person that's doing the 1915I specific Medicaid eligibility. That is gonna be determined within that particular zone and the capacity they have in staff assignments there. Does that make, make sense for us here? I think here, yeah. you know a little bit more about 1959, so I'm gonna expand Marcella here. So thanks, Ambrosia. So it's all great. So find your human services zones. Um, the HUDAS, this is Department of Human Services on completing the HUDAS. There's a link to that. It needs to be completed by an independent practitioner. It's fairly easy to get certified in doing the HUDAS. It's basically like a, um, you have to watch a couple of videos, you have to take a short test, and then you have to submit that to the, submit your information that you've done all of this to the World Health Organization. And then you can, you too can be certified in doing the HUDAS. So you can help people negotiate that process because most people are coming into the zones with that food ass documentation in order to move that process forward. Um, so there's some trainings, administration scoring, sign the user agreement, and then there's a whole training manual. So that's something that you or other members of the community can do. There's no degree requirements for that. Um, it is required that you are not somehow related to the individual that you're assessing. Um, and then also, as we said, part of the eligibility determination is the qualifying um, behavioral health diagnosis. So you're going to have to get, there are requirements here. You need a licensed clinician by clinician. That could be a psychiatrist. That could be a psychologist. That could be a social worker. That could be a professional counselor. That could be an addictions counselor, et cetera. Um, they have to have um, the right ICD-10 code. That's the behavioral health diagnosis that's required. There's a link here to the form from the state that helps them fill that out. Um, you can help the person fill that out, but it, ultimately they have to be assessed and diagnosed by a licensed clinician. Um, ooh, Monica's got um, intel on who's interested in administering the UDAS. Um, yeah, so I- yeah, I've been here, yeah. Yeah, I made some recommendations on some updates to the slide, and this is doesn't reflect those recommendations. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm hoping that going forward, the other slides do. Um, I do want to clarify at the bottom, it says any clinician licensed to provide a diagnosis in North Dakota. It doesn't have to be a North Dakota clinician or okay. licensed in North Dakota. It can be any clinician. Um, the HUDAS training, I can train someone to do the HUDAS administration. Um, there isn't actually a piece that goes to the World Health Organization that might've been in the past, but there's not even a user agreement anymore for that. It's all it's all on the state now where we provide the trainings. Um, I don't recommend using both these links. So if anybody's interested, just reach out to me. I'm getting trained. Thanks, Monica. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So yeah, we'll make that, we'll make those changes before we set up the final slide deck to everybody. So yeah, all right, next slide. Oh, quickly just to answer, answer that question in chat. Can the agency that provides the service also do the HUDAS? No, you could do the HUDAS for an um, individual who is served by another agency. So if you're interested in doing that, say partnering up with an agency, you're both trained to do the HUDAS, you could do that for each other's individuals. Um, that's sometimes a, a good partnership to have, but no, if you're gonna serve an individual, you can't do that assessment for eligibility that the HUDAS would be part of. That's part of the conflict of interest requirements, so yes. So this is the form that the zones will be taking us through. This is form 740, state form 741. There's a website to the form. You've got the uh, list of all of the different licensure requirements, behavioral health licensure requirements. So you want to say, you know, I've got this person and they say they're a licensed clinician. Do they, can they fill out the diagnostic form? Take a look at that and make sure that they've got one of the licenses that's listed on the state form. Um, but you see addiction counselors, counselors, social work, psychologists, physicians, um, all of them should be able to do that form. You would have somebody complete that form before they go into the human services zones. You would bring that form into the human services zones as a person's having their appointment for the 1915I eligibility form. Um, Monica, do you know, are the zones able to make referrals to those kind of clinicians if you don't know someone? I mean, hopefully folks are enrolled and Medicaid at this point. Um, no, not really. That's not really their role. Um, okay. Really, they're, with the 1959, the expectation is the individual 
would just submit to the zone. It's not even an in-person appointment um, other than the HUDAS assessment if the zone is doing the HUDAS. So yeah, the, the form would all be filled out. Um, they're not going to recommend any clinician okay. at all. Yeah. That's helpful. That's helpful just so folks are clear and have the expectations there. Okay, cool. Next slide. All right. We're taking a break for a few minutes. We've um, hung out for a little while. We're going to move past through those pretty quickly, though. So maybe we should um, move forward and move our break out a little bit. What do you think, Martella? It's whatever's good for folks. I'd be good to ask if anybody have any questions right now, though I like, yeah. you know, Doreen and others are jumping in the chat here. Any other questions? Will there be a uh, list of providers who do the HUDAS? So I have not um, seen that. There isn't right now because we don't really have, a, the zones are required to. Um, we don't really have, we have one other agency that has an arrangement with one particular provider to do their HUDAS. Um, I would love to have a network throughout the state um, when we have more providers or more, more groups um, getting trained to do the HUDAS. Yeah, we'll definitely provide that list on our website. <clears throat> That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Any other questions? Sorry. So, Monica, who at the zone does the HUDAS? Um, each of the zones has one individual or maybe two designated to do them. Um, so, it's, you know, a lot of them are working in the child protection realm. Um, in, in Cass County, it's Lisa Norstead. Um, but yeah, they, there's a there's a designated person at each of the zones. So really, um, anybody should be able to call the human service zone and ask for the um, to make an appointment with the Hudas administrator, and they should be able to get an appointment set up that way. We do have a list, but you know, with turnover, like everywhere else, the zones have it too, and sometimes those positions change over. So it, it, we don't want to publish that list because it'll almost always be wrong. For for at least one of the zones. Thank you. You bet. Why don't we just look at the other slides, Ambrosia? Yeah, why don't we take this break? We're at a uh, half hour after. Why don't we come back at 10, uh, I'm mean, sorry, at 20 of, um, and um, we'll uh, just give you guys just a quick break. All right, thanks everybody.
Hey everybody, welcome back. We, uh, we're taking a look at slides. That was not the only, the Houdas slide was not the only slide we had some issues with. So we are kind of moving us back a little bit um, and making sure that we get all the details on here. So um, welcome back. We're talking about participant eligibility, how a person goes from being a person in your community with a behavioral health related need and at risk of institutionalization to somebody who's living in the community receiving the services that they need in order to be to remaining in that community setting and not to be at risk of institutionalization or, or homelessness or housing instability and how important how important that is. So we talked about Medicaid enrollment, making sure people are enrolled, and then moved on to 1915I eligibility. Um, this is the uh, state form 741. Um, this is the first page of that. It gives you all the application information, et cetera. And we did, we're missing a couple slides. So next slide, please. We should have done that before the break. So parent and legal guardian information, remember the 1959 services is available to children as well as adults. Not all services are available to children, but many of them are. Contact information, signatures. Remember 1915I is a voluntary service. That means that an individual needs to be able to, to sign the form and request the related services unless there's a parent or legal guardian involved and then that person could sign the form as well. Uh, a human services worker also has to be signing the form in order to, to move through the eligibility process and their the dates are all down there. So next slide, please. Then there's the diagnostic form. This is the form that needs to be signed by a qualifying behavioral health provider. It gives them the diagnosis, what's called the International Classification of Disease or ICD-10 code. Uh, Monica, always jump in. You don't even have to raise your hand, just jump in. So the slide previous, um, I did just want to clarify in that too, that we, um, if we could go back, thank you. So the alternate contact information is a very, very important piece of this application. Um, the population that we're serving sometimes is transient, sometimes doesn't really have a good working phone. This allows us to contact someone else if we can't reach the person, if there's a problem with their application. So if you are assisting somebody that you serve to apply for 1915i, please put your contact information here. If Jennifer is helping them, if the zone is helping them, um, you know, get this application in and there's a problem, we will reach out to you if we can't get a hold of the person and say, hey, you know, we really need to reach this person. Next time you see them, can you help them contact us? Um, we have 30 days from when the application is submitted until it, um, it can go into a pending status. We have 30 days for that application to get fixed and submitted fully or it is declined because it's not complete. So that sounds like a lot of time, it's really not. So we really wanna stay on top of that, um, on top of those problems with the applications and make sure that we're, we're able to reach out as effectively as possible. So that's, that's it, thank you. That's a really important. No, those are really, really important points, absolutely. All right, alternative contact information, mm -hmm. thank you. So we were, let's see, requesting, this is the diagnostic slide. Um, you have to have the information on the diagnosing professional. You'll see, as we said, it has to be a licensed professional and the political licensure is listed there. That's all required also for this slide um, to go forward. Um, this is the kind of thing that's missing in the form. The licensure number is the sort of thing that the zone will push back and say, you know, we can't move the application forward. And as Monica said, you've got 30 days for that. Yeah, um, um, I did did want to just um, make a note too that in lieu of this section on the application, it is appropriate that you could submit a printout from a person's electronic health record showing that their diagnosis is on there. We did make that change pretty recently. Um, we were just finding a barrier to getting these clinicians, getting appointments in, you know, um, people are months and months out with appointments. So we wanted to make that, um, make that change. So any electronic health record printout that shows that diagnosis will suffice for this section. Um, it looks like Leanne had a question too. Um, if you can assist individuals completing this application before they're approved. The answer is yes. Um, you certainly can. We have a process already established built in to kind of mitigate any kind of conflict of interest with that. So if you're helping someone with the application, they turn it into the zone, your hands off at that point. From that point, the zone process takes over. They determine the eligibility. If there's problems with that, they reach out to um, Jennifer, our navigator, who becomes involved in that process. Jennifer then, once they're approved, 
works with them if they don't connect independently with you or with the provider of their choice, Jennifer works to help them get connected. So we're removing that piece where the provider is helping the person do the application and knowing what the status is. Um, like I said, once you once that person turns in their application, it's hands off until they reach back out to you to request you for services. So hopefully that makes sense. Monica, is that at all different in provider shortage areas versus non-provider shortage areas? Um, no, no, we would okay. not. We would not want to see a provider um, have any involvement once that application is turned in. Got it. And so, okay. I mean that just and and it sounds silly wow. because in some areas we only have one provider, so like the choice is of one provider, <laughs> but we still want to make sure that that choice is there. And you know, in the event that we have other providers enroll, that system is already you know in place, and that's nice. the process that we follow. Got it. Got it. That sounds good. That makes perfect sense. All right, good, good. All right, so this is the diagnostic piece. Remember, we saw all of this slides with eligibility criteria. This is how you prove all of that eligibility criteria to the state so that you can get enrolled into the system. Next slide, please. So this is the HUDAS assessment score. So this is the who, you know, where you're putting in, who, what was the score, what, um, how they did in each of the domains, who was the qualified administrator there, um, and that's the process as well. That's also correct. Sometimes it seems to be the zones are, are able and willing to do the HUDAS themselves. Again, Monica, I'm going to defer to you. Sometimes it's the more community related providers, um, but this is something that's going to have to be completed for somebody's 1915I eligibility process to move forward. Yeah, that the zones are actually required. We have an yeah. agreement with them through the DHS yeah. that they are required to do the HUDAS, um, yeah. but we do have like our human service centers use the HUDAS as well. So if somebody has one that's recent enough to submit with the application, then they can do that. Um, just it. has to be within 30 days of the person applying. So if somebody like Leanne's trying to help somebody get through that process, what I'm hearing now is you need the inf income information, you need the diagnostic information to come in, but the zone will work on the HUDAS. The zone will do the HUDAS process. Yeah, that's correct. That's good. And then once the HUDAS completed, will it be given to the client? I believe the client could request it. Um, but mainly it's moving through the process for eligibility determination. Yeah, ideally we'd want to see, you know, the individual show up for their HUDAS appointment with that eligibility application already the rest of the way completed, and then to have them leave it at the zone, and that HUDAS administrator could then make sure that that eligibility worker gets it. That would be ideal. If, if it leaves the building again, there's a good chance it's not going to get back. So <laughs> if we can avoid that, that's great. That's really important. I mean, they yes. could they could request a copy of it. At, you know, there's no reason that they can't have that information. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, Wendy's got a great question. Do clients need to request to apply for the I? Are they eligible when applying for Medicaid? I think they would have to make that additional request. That is not yeah. something that's going to be normal. Or a family member, somebody who's working with them, somebody who's helping with them in some way, and and then we're relying on you to get the word out about these services are there. You're going to be offering some of these services. Other community providers are going to be offering them, wanting to get people through this process. Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, an eligibility worker might notice a challenge somebody's having and kind of, you know, make a suggestion that they move over in this process, but it's not something standard. So you really want to be there to advocate for people. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with Fontella there. We, ideally, 1959 is still relatively new. Ideally, what we would love is for it to be considered part of that full package, that somebody who applies for Medicaid gets approved, then, <coughs> excuse me, they find out about TANF and LIHEAP and, and food assistance and all those things. We're just not there yet. Where that eligibility worker, it's just not part of their thing. It's not part of their spiel. It's not part of the package in their minds kind of yet. So, um, two years from now, I hope that that's different. But right now, yeah, we're really relying on those outside yeah. outside sources. So, Monica, I kind of had a follow up question, just clarifying, and maybe people already got here themselves. So that might the flow might be that maybe we're supporting our client or participant in first enrolling in Medicaid, generally mm -hmm. speaking, and then helping to coordinate the assessment that their diagnostic assessment that they're going to need to partially complete this 1959 form to prepare for that HUDAS screening if they're not doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? So, Because they'll probably need Medicaid to pay for that assessment to be done, likely, if they don't have another okay. source of coverage okay. yes, to get the diagnosis. Yep. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. All right. Next slide. 
process of UDAS being done by the zones. Okay. So DHS also keeps a list of enrolled providers. Um, please keep checking this list. This list is updated everybody every time somebody goes through the provider enrollment process successfully. Um, they keep a list for separate list for care coordination providers. Remember, when we learn about the services, we're going to learn that care coordination is really the door to all of those services. Everybody receives care coordination, and then that assessment helps them see what other services they need. Community transition providers, 1915I, housing support, or any other 1915I providers will all be on this list. These are the lists also that the care coordinator agency, so if your agency is offering care coordination, you're like, I'm getting people, I'm doing their plans, where do I send them out to? This is something you want to constantly be checking and rechecking for what are the providers in the communities where the people that you're assessing and doing the care coordination world live. So it's going to be very important to make those connections. So you find it on the DHS website to find a care coordination provider. Care coordination providers also go back in to find all the other services. And then next slide, please. So you've heard me a couple of times talk about a provider shortage area. Provider shortage area is actually a federal designation. It means that in communities where we'd really like to have a conflict of interest, we'd like to make sure that People are, are not just referring to all of the services that they offer. They're making sure people get a very tailored and individualized service. But the reality is in a lot of rural areas, as Monica said, there's one provider. You couldn't have a conflict of interest. Somebody's doing the assessment, then nobody's doing the services. That's not what we want. So, so as you all know, North Dakota is an extremely rural state. There are only five counties, Cass, Burley, a couple of others that are not in the provider shortage areas. So these conflict of interest requirements that we talked about are waived in a provider shortage area. The same agency can do, if you're operating in one of those counties, the same agency can do the assessment, the person-centered plan, they can do the care coordination services, and they can do the other 11 services that are part of the 1915I. Um, if you are in a provider, if you are in a non-provider shortage area, one of those five counties, then if you do the care coordination, you're gonna have to refer to another agency for those other services. Highly recommend, go back, take a look at that list of providers and say, who else is doing the services in my community? If I'm doing care coordination, who do I want to refer to? Get on the phone, talk to those people, see what services they offer, see what people they work best with, get a sense of where these other services are in your community. Maybe develop a memorandum of understanding about how you do a seamless referral process between your agency that does care, care coordination and the agencies that do the other services. Or if you do the other services, find out who's doing care coordination agency, care coordination in your community and say, hey, um, I'm doing these other services. I'm doing benefits navigation, peer support, training for family caregivers. Um, can we be on your list of places that you refer people to? So it's about building your network of people who do things that your agency doesn't and can make those, um, um, make those connections for you. So yes. Monica, did you have more? Yeah, I did just want to clarify. So, um, you know, in the non-provider shortage or in the provider shortage areas where one agency can do the care coordination and the other services, those do still have to be done by two separate individuals. So one person can do the care coordination. If there's one other employee that's enrolled to provide all of the other services, that other employee can do all of those services for the people. So that's kind of um, CMS's way of still, still having a degree of separation between between the person who does the plan of care and the person who provides those services. Where in, you know, those non-shortage areas, they, um, you know, they have to be separate agencies. Um, I did also want to mention one thing that we're negotiating with CMS right now, a change to how we determine the provider shortage areas. Um, and so I'm hoping that um, we will have a different way of approaching this in the future that'll make more sense based on actual provider enrollment versus what has been determined to be a shortage area by UND. Um, there, there's no real great way to bridge the gap between the reality and what it looks like on paper for, you know, for those who made that determination. So look for updates on that. Um, I'll definitely share, you know, when that happens, that'll be, that'll mean our new amendment is approved and that we'll have a lot of updates to share with everyone. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. We'll make sure we change that slide when you get that. Mm -hmm. that, et cetera. Any timeline now or timelines aren't something CMS does a lot of, so you might be saying no. But. <laughs> we are hoping to submit the new amendment. Um, we're actually in the public comment period right now. Great. Um, we've made the changes. We, uh, you know, we're ready to go. 
Um, so we hope to submit it, I mean, within the next month or so, and then they have 90 days to come back with any, you know, um, objections or changes or whatnot. So, um, yeah, within the next three, four months, I would, I would say, hopefully we'll all be, everything will be ironed out. That's great. That's yeah. great. Look forward to it. I hope it works better for folks on the ground. That's, that's what matters. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, like we, you know, everything looks great on paper. And then in the implementation phase, things really look a lot different. So we just, you know, we really rely on our stakeholders and their feedback and just, you know, working to constantly make things better for the eye and make it more, you know, obtainable and workable for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So next slide. So that's conflict of interest policy. So next slide, please. So I think this is just sort of our summing up slide. This is just a number of provider links. These are things you might want to bookmark. The state's website, the provider enrollment overview, the state's training on that, uh, the state's training on an agency provider enrollment overview, and then individual provider enrollment overview. Uh, you've got information on the MCOs and expansions for your expansion members. Um, you've got the eligibility tracker, which Ambrosia sent out. That tells you, and that helps you track all of the information, what people's Medicaid numbers are, whether they're traditional or expansion, um, and the other information that you're going to need as we move forward into billing. Um, there is also really excellent trainings. We don't want to repeat them because we just can't say anything more. They're really well done on the state website about the service authorizations. Something that providers who are new to Medicaid often find is that they're not used to provider authorizations. The human services zones is going to be off, is be going to be uh, delivering provider. Who delivers the provider authorization number, Monica? I believe it's the zones, correct? For care coordination. And then who gives them the authorization numbers? Um, no, that that's not the zones. The um, okay. service authorizations, the requests are submitted by the care coordination agency in MMIS, and those are approved by the state. The and state. then, yeah, so then once that's approved, then you would use that service authorization number in with your billing. Yeah. So that's going to be really important. Getting that authorization number, you need that authorization for all of your claims that you submit. You'll be getting that from there. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and then there's also just some more trainings that we want to highlight. We're going to get into billing in session five, um, but policies and claims and billing, it really would be helpful for people if they take and look through some of those links, et cetera, um, before we get into that. I think you'll get more out of session five if you've looked at some of the state's questions as well. Uh, some of the states, not the state's questions, the state's, the state's training on this, because we want to give you time in your work group to see, to, and to work on your work plans and say, okay, what do we track? What do we not track? If we're going to change, what do we start tracking? What do we do? So it's really important. If there's one thing you came out of here, it's important to understand the process of how people get the services. It's important to track once you're through provider enrollment, you've got access to that AVRS system that can tell you Marcella's Medicaid's on as of 8-1, Embrage's Medicaid's off as of 7-30. You know, here's some things that we need to do. You need that information. You, you cannot bill for services for people whose Medicaid enrollment is not on the day that you deliver those services. That's just absolutely essential. So you've got to track that information. Most agencies track that information, I would say on a monthly basis. Um, hospitals probably do it, do it on a daily basis, but if you're doing a community service like this, you usually check in that system for everybody you're serving on a once a month basis, just to make sure. Um, you also talk to your members about have they gotten any paperwork or any mail or any email or any text from DHS that says they need to do something to keep their Medicaid um, authorization going, Medicaid enrollment going. I will also, oh, jump in. We actually do recommend that you check in AVRS prior to serving someone every yes. day because it can change. Um, and we've had situations where providers have provided services for people who weren't eligible yeah. and that service is not billable. Not so billable. that's really unfortunate, yeah. So yes, I will also say you're also now joining the group of us who are watching very closely as to how long the public health emergency will be in place. The states have been have been not allowed in uh, not allowed to do what's called a redetermination process, checking to see if people say, okay, you were eligible for Medicaid in 2018, but are you still eligible for Medicaid in 2020? Because of the COVID public health emergency, those state redetermination processes have been 
suspended is maybe a little strong word. The states can still sort of look and check the paperwork, et cetera, but they can't, um, they can't disenroll anyone while we're in the public health emergency. So as soon as the states are clear when the public health emergency is ending, they are preparing now in order to do a widespread redetermination for everybody who's on the Medicaid rolls. The expectation is that nationwide, we're going to lose about 10 to 15 million people who are no longer be on the Medicaid rolls uh, because of the redetermination. But we don't know. So what we know right now is that the public health emergency is in place until mid-October. We know that the Biden administration has committed to the states that they will be given at least 60 days notice. So sometime around October 15th or October 16th, you're going to see headlines, either headlines that says public health emergency is being extended or headlines that said HHS didn't say anything. If they were going to stop it in October, they would have told us in August. So we're kind of assuming that it's going to keep going. What I'm hearing from my federal contacts is we expect it will go through the end of the uh, calendar year. Um, for COVID related reasons, I wonder if it's also for budget related reasons. It's so much easier to end this on December 31st than it is in October, et cetera. But so watch for when the public health emergency ends. When the public health emergency ends, you need to be, as a provider who doesn't want to get in caught, what Monica described as a, you know, delivering services to somebody who's not enrolled today, you want to be much more assertive in your outreach and engagement with the people you're serving. What have they, communications have they gotten about their Medicaid enrollment? What do they have to do to keep enrolled? Do they have to go back to the zones? What support do they need to make that happen? I know one of the services many of you will be offering is going to pay benefits navigation. This kind of support is exactly what falls under the benefits navigation service. So clearly in the service definitions, you could do that. You could bill for that as long as people stay enrolled. So watch for when the public health emergency is going to end. Watch for, uh, help people understand that if they're getting letters, they're getting emails, they're getting some kind of communication from DHS about you have to do A, B, and C in order to keep your Medicaid enrollment going. You have to come back with income documentation. You have to come back with, you know, an SSI letter, et cetera. Help them do that. That will help them maintain their enrollment or what we also call continuous coverage. We don't want to see a lap in coverage, both for their own healthcare related needs, as well as your, for your agency getting paid for the service that you offer. So, any questions? All right, so next slide, I believe, are we on the breakouts yet? It looks like there's a question. Oh. Um, yeah. Once approved for the 1959 service and the care coordinator, how long can they use the service? So the services are, as long as there continues to be an assessed need, they're ongoing, like there is no limit as far as like the length of time. Now, the care coordinator is going to authorize their services from the date that they start working with the individual until the last day of their 1959 eligibility, which is a year or less. And then prior to that expiration of their eligibility, they're going to re-up, they're going to help the person do the redetermination for eligibility, and they're going to re-up their service authorization for an additional year. So all of those services, you know, really are meant to, like Martel said, to be no gap in service, you know, continuous services. So we can help to support that person throughout. Um, one really important thing to do too for the care coordinator is to monitor those eligibility expiration dates because as the care coordinator, helping that person maintain their eligibility for 1959 is all billable time. So helping them fill out that application, helping them get all that documentation they need, helping them set up that new HUDOS assessment appointment, all of those activities are related to maintaining the person's eligibility. And so they're, yeah, like I said, all billable time. So it's really, um, you know, important to keep that, to keep that going for the individual. And then they don't lapse in their services for those other services they're receiving either. Yeah. And, and Monica, do they go back to the human services zones at that year or when their eligibility lapses, et cetera? And so the human services zones are doing the re are redetermining eligibility for the I. They are, yep. Yeah. And it's literally just the, the, it's the application all over again. There isn't like a shortened form because we do need to verify, you know, all of the points on the application. So it's helping them fill out that SFN 741 um, and then get everything that goes along with that. Um, so uh, Leanne had a question about the, um, the redetermination year. 
So it's not always, this gets a little confusing. When somebody's approved, they have, they get approved for an eligibility span for 1915I. That initially the idea was that we would align those dates with their eligibility determination for Medicaid. So their annual redetermination. Now, what we found in the very beginning is that we had a couple of folks who were approved, hadn't even had a chance to connect with the care, co care coordinator yet. And like a month later, their eligibility is coming due for Medicaid. So all of a sudden they're off of 1915 and I, they didn't even know they were really getting services yet. Like there was a whole thing. So we had to kind of make some different, different rules for the eligibility workers to follow. So it's either going to be, it's going to align their first time it's going to align with their Medicaid eligibility redetermination date, or it's going to be six months from when they were approved. We're not going to see any that are shorter than a six month span with the intention that within a couple of cycles of the eligibility that those dates would align with their Medicaid eligibility if that makes any sense at all. It, it, it seems really confusing and our policy reads exactly the way I said it and it reads a little confusing, but yeah, it's either gonna be like, if I'm, if I'm eligible today and my Medicaid eligibility is coming up in two months, they're gonna put my eligibility out like six months. They can't go further than a year to line up that date right away. So it's gonna be no less than six months initially it might be, it's never probably going to be exactly a year the first time because it's very unlikely that someone's getting approved on the same day their Medicaid is re-upped again, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, sorry, I, I didn't want to get too into the weeds with that. But. Be, well, this is, this, is what people, this is what people need to know. Yeah. What I will say is I would recommend at the 10 month mark, mm -hmm. like if you were at, let, let me say this, let me frame it a better way. At the something is going to no longer be in place at in two months from now, that's when you should start this process. So you should have a trigger in your system that says, Marcella's Medicaid is going to run out in two months. We should start talking to her about what do we do to keep it going. Monica's 1915I eligibility is going to run out in two months. You know, we should be working on getting that diagnosis for, you know, getting the diagnostic form filled out. Sarah had a good questionnaire. Will they need to re-verify diagnosis to food asset redetermination? I believe they will, correct? So the diagnosis, if nothing has changed, we can literally resubmit like that same printout if we have a printout of there's no diagnosis. date requirement on it. No like date it doesn't have to be. Um, no, it doesn't need to be verified again. Um, if you don't have that printout though, yeah, we do need that portion of the application uh, filled out again with that diagnosis and the, the, the signature of the clinician. Yeah. And the HUDAS always, CMS says the HUDAS can never be more than one year old, which is why we need a real current one when we first apply. Yeah. Yeah. But Monica, the human services zones are doing the HUDAS. Mm -hmm. Yep. They're required yep. to do that. So Sarah, if you're not a human services zone, you're from an outside agency, which I think you are, then you, um, if you've got the old diagnostic form, you've got it, and then you know work with the human services zones to get the HUDAS done. And then yeah. people should be redetermined if successfully. Yeah, but that whole application needs to be submitted. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, we've got a billing question. Yeah. Billing questions are for session five. <laughs> Care coordinator. Sorry. No, no, no. This is everybody wants to billing. I swear we should do billing first because that's what everybody needs to know. Uh, care coordination agencies will submit their own bills and the aging providing services submit their own bills. So care coordination agencies will submit bills for care coordination agencies that are doing other services that are doing care support that are doing training will submit to the state medicaid managed care manage, state medicaid information system or mmis and or you will submit to well not and or you will submit to the uh, you will submit to blue cross blue shield where, where you submit, that's why we said it's really important to know, are your people, you see it on our eligibility tracker, are the people you're working with, are they traditional Medicaid or are they Medicaid expansion? If they're traditional Medicaid, you're submitting to the state. If they're Medicaid expansion, you're submitting to Blue Cross. And we will get into much more detail about that, Jennifer, I promise, in session five. Mm -hmm. Slides and all. All right. So next slide, please. Slides and links. Okay. So this is just a slide to help people think through sort of in one process what the traditional 
uh, movement from home and community-based services. That's at the end of the day, that's what the 1915I is. It's an HCBS program. Um, and this is the path. This is the path that happens. So you have an agency that does care coordination. They are they receive a referral from the human services zones. They develop what's called a person-centered plan of care. You see these called PCPs. In this case, it means person-centered plan. You see them called POCs, plan of care. That determines the goals based on the needs assessed by the HUDAS. These are the things. I have trouble with budgeting. I have trouble with medication management. I have trouble with my downtime and keeping my recovery going. And all of those things, you link the, this is the functional limitation I have. This is the service that helps me address that functional limitation. You request other services based on the type of support that's needed um, to help the individual achieve their goals. So most individuals have some goal. They want to maintain housing in the community. They want to maintain relationships. They want to maintain employment. They want to maintain their health. They want to maintain positive daily activities, all of those sorts of things. Those are traditional goals. Those are the way clinicians talk about it, not the way normal people talk about it. They always want to see the language in the, per in the language of the person whose goal it is. I've never seen a, a person with no history as a clinician ever use the phrase, I want to medic man you know, do medication management. Yeah, that's just the way we talk, et cetera. So it's always important to have it. Now, a person may say, I want to stay out of the hospital. And you're linking that. And I'm sorry about my dog. He's very excited about these points. Um, <laughs> Um, you are always linking it back to that person's language and that person's goals, um, but that's how it's connected. The care coordinator completes and then sends to each provider that plan of care via a request for services provider form. This is saying, so Marcella was assessed by Ambrosia. She picked Monica's agency. Ambrosia is going to be sending that request for service provider form to Monica's agency so that I can receive the services from Monica's agency. I got care coordination from Ambrosia, but at the end of the day, it's just an assessment. It's not the actual services. It's the assessment that says I need these services. It's Monica's agency in my example who's going to be delivering the services. That's the role that many of you be playing. The care coordinator submits the plan of care and the service authorization request to the state's MMIS system. As Monica said, it's the state MMIS that, deliver, that um, uh, delivers the authorization. Um, and then Blue Cross Blue Shield will do that for people who are Medicaid expansion. There's also a DHS training on this process and we have that link there as well. So I think this just helps from a person-centered perspective, meaning from the individual who's receiving services. It always helps to me to think about because different people are at different places in this process, different agencies and different individuals have different roles in this process. I think I find this slide helpful because it says from the person who's receiving the services, this is their experience and we're trying to move, that, move them through that process. Um, I did want to just make sure that everyone's clear on what happens just prior to what's on this slide, how that person gets to you. So the person has submitted their application to the zone, they've been approved, they get a letter that says you've been approved. Here's your care coordinators in your area, please contact one. Now we realized that wasn't really happening. The people were approved and just not seeking those services. So we hired Jennifer, our navigator, to fill that gap. So if somebody doesn't show in our system to have made that connection with the care coordinator by a week, a week and a half in, Jennifer's reaching out to them and helping them connect to a care coordinator. So she's looking at that list of where they live and saying XYZ providers are available in your area. Here's a little bit about what they're all about, you know, helping them make an informed choice about which agency. And it might be that say someone wants to get supported employment from a certain agency. Well, then she's guiding them to choose a different agency for care coordination so that they can keep those services separately and get both. If the individual were to choose um, you know, say in Fargo, if an individual were to choose one agency um, for care coordination, they couldn't get those other services from them, right? So, so there's a there's a lot that goes into that process and a lot of conversation that happens there. Um, so just, you know, wanting everybody to understand truly how an individual comes in your door or reaches out to you, they might reach out individually on their own, they may have somebody else helping them with that. They, and that person might be Jennifer or it might be someone else in the community or a family member or a friend that helps them make that connection. That's such a good point, such a good point. And that's why your point earlier, Monica, about the alternative coordinate, uh, alternative contact is so important. Yeah. Because that's my guess is something else that Jennifer's going to is she's making this follow up. If there's an alternative yeah. contact, yeah. Yep. that's what we yep. give it. We could get that assistance as well. All right.
Next slide. All right. So just to give you again the overall, um, and this is this is what happens after the next slide. So your agency, you're not doing care coordination now. You're doing the other services, housing support, benefits navigation, training for family caregivers. You get from the care coordination agency this request for service provider form. Your agency will also submit a service authorization request via MMIS for traditional Medicaid, via Availity, which is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Clearinghouse for Medicaid expansion population. Again, why it's so important to know who's who. Um, you'll get that service authorization from there. You'll deliver the services according to the plan of care. That authorization number you get in this process is important. For every claim you submit, it must have the authorization number included in that. Um, and or the, or the claim will not be um, approved. There is a linkage between, when the authorization number is given, there's a linkage within these systems for, the, for your agency's Medicaid ID. So a authorization number is delivered to a particular Medicaid ID, your agency's Medicaid ID. That Medicaid ID is linked to a provider identifier. All of that information goes on every claim and all of those links must be there for the claim to be paid. So it's really important that you get all of those pieces correct. And these are all automated systems. If anything is off, an I is not dotted, a T is not crossed, the computer, the computer just sends it back to you and says it's wrong. Hopefully they give you good guidance on what it is you need to fix, et cetera. Um, but those are just some of the most common mistakes we see. So there's a linkage within the Medicaid data systems of this NPI with this Medicaid ID that's allowed for this agency, that's allowed to offer these services to this prior authorization. All of those are linked, all of those are required on every claim. And I do just wanna put in a little information plug based on some conversations I've had over the last few months, that that is what allows different types of HCBS services to be delivered to the same person. So 1915I services, the provider's linked to that service doc, which is linked to that NPI and all that good stuff. So the services that you're providing are specific to 1915I. So if they're also getting services from the aging and disabilities, um, HCBS services, that's going to be a different service authorization. So if you ever hear that a person can't get 1915I because Aging is already billing for HCBS. That's not true. They're separated by those service authorizations, and that's what distinguishes the differences in the services within MMIS. That's a really important point. Mm -hmm. Really, really important point. So, yes. So, you've now got an authorization. Your agency's enrolled. The people you're working with are eligible and enrolled. That you've got a plan of care. You're working from the plan of care. You're delivering the services according to the plan of care. You're documenting the services according to the plan of care under each authorization number. And then you can move on to claim submission. Um, and we'll go into our entire session five, will be basically that one gray box claim submitted. That's all of session five. So yes, claims documentation must include the service authorization number. Yes, all of these, all of these link up. Yes. Next, next slide, please. All right, we are here for questions. We're going to give you some breakout time in a little bit, so you can go back as your teams can go back to your work plans and say, okay, what do we do? What do we track? What do we need to do in order to move this forward? Um, as I said, if you're an agency of one or two, that might just be a, a work, you know, work plan is, is a, the fancy term for when there's 10 of you, we all need to do our each piece. You know, when it's just one of you, one or two of you, it might just be called a to-do list. That's how I best think of a work plan. All right. Ambrosia has got the work plan template in there. Oh, Ambrosia, can you put up the eligibility tracker too, so people can download that as well? You'll get it in the slide link, but I think that's always a good thing for people to have. Also know that any of these tools, nothing are required here. CSH has no authority to require anything. We've just found other agencies have found them helpful. You don't want to start from scratch. You want to build it, but adapt it, make it work for you and your agency. Any questions? You guys are allowed to talk to if, if Talking is easier than typing. That is allowed here. You can come off mute and ask the question. Uh, 
I want to make one more point really quick about we were talking about the eligibility dates, kind of the differences and what plays into that. Um, you all don't have to worry too much about the why of that piece. So when your agency is going to be doing care coordination for someone, you're going to let us know that via a form that we've developed. And we're going to reach back out to you and say, okay, this is the eligibility worker for this person. This is what you need to ask them. You need to request the all the eligibility documents, which is like the application and the HUDAS and all that stuff. You're going to ask them for the eligibility span for 1959. You're also going to ask them when their Medicaid expires. And then you're also going to ask them whether they're traditional or expansion. So, and we're going to, we're going to bounce that, those questions back to you every single time that you tell us you're going to do care coordination for someone. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible and, um, you know, only bogging you down with the details you need to know. So um, hopefully that kind of, you know, eases your mind a little bit about having to worry about, you know, all of those different dates. We're going to tell you what you need to ask and you're going to get that from that eligibility worker. And then it's just a matter of tracking those dates on a calendar. No final questions. We didn't hear hearing and seeing none. I guess we're ready to do some actual work. Now it's your time. Now it's your turn. <laughs> So we're going to take about 15 minutes. You're going to you're already mostly pre-assigned to breakout rooms. Um, anyone remaining will just let us know what agency you belong to if we didn't already um, recognize um, by the respective email address, and we'll push you to the, the breakout room accordingly. Or if you're an organization of one and it's a one man one woman show, then you're, we're just going to be chatting with yourself about this stuff, right? And that's okay if we're wearing more than one hat. Um, but really, our goal is to use. Potentially, if you want our agency work plan, like uh, Marcel said, there's no requirements to utilize a particular tool. You may be further along and um, already have something that helps you to track what you're um, wanting to do in order to um, transition or expand in this space. Or maybe um, this is a preliminary conversation that you're just having. Um, so again, the whole point for the breakout room is to really dive deep and figure out, like, who are we serving? And do we even know their Medicaid enrollment status, right? We talked about ways to verify that or help support people in um, obtaining Medicaid if they don't have it and what some of the eligibility criteria is. How are you going to track this? You can use our eligibility tracker I dropped in the chat. You maybe have your own systems. Um, you want to integrate some of the elements in that tracker into those existing systems. And then who is the person at your agency that's going to track the tracker? Who is going to be the one that tracks the status? Because um, you want to have a point person, because if it's everyone, then it's no one, right? So we have to have a, a point of contact or person with that designated role. And then looking at that work plan, we have some sample um, language around some ideas of what we should be working on and maybe potentially what years or phases that's going to look like. But maybe take a moment and say what else needs to be um, addressed that you didn't consider until today based on what we've learned, right? What, what else do you need to do? as an organization to stand up, stand this up or get ready to, to work. So we're going to be breaking out into groups. So if you disappear, that's why. And if you're still here, tell me where you work. Rooms are breaking out, guys. Bear with us.
Can you guys send me to the state breakout room? Jennifer, I don't think we create we created one for this for the state because our assumption. I mean, you guys are, you know, love you guys. You're here for support. You're not like in my mind. You're not developing your own work plan for this process. Um, yeah, Monica said she was in a group somehow and to Got go it. over to hers. So I don't really know what to do either. <laughs> okay, Monica. Okay, let me see. Where did my, where over did... there, nd.gov. We have one. Okay. okay. All right. Let me let next. me try to get you over there. Give me a second, please. Can you just type your email into the chat for me, please? Because I don't have you on my reg list. For the four or five folks that are still on here, can you also put your email in the chat and where where you should go? Or Leanne, I see you on here twice, so my guess is you're with you. Um, if you, if there's anybody else who should be connected to, or any of these other breakout rooms, I just want to make sure that that Hillary's got what she needs to to get the right people together in breakout rooms. All right, it's Deb Gluttony, and I'm with. Um, I should be with Leanne in the breakout session. Okay. All right. So there's two Leanne. What we see oh. is Leanne in twice. We should just put you guys in one breakout room. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Correct. Do you still need my email? If you could throw it in there, that'd be easy. Thank you. Hillary, I'm still seeing Jennifer. I don't think Jennifer's moved yet. Yes, Leanne, that sounds great for you and Deb to just call each other. Sounds perfect. Yeah, I put her in. Let me let me check. Hang on. She's still. Jennifer, lovely seeing you, but I know you won't be in the right place. I think she went that time. Okay, good. And then I got an email uh, from a Tara Helfrick. She should be with the Nexus Path Group.
right. Brandon's got, thanks, Brandon. He's got a connection there. And then do we have a Williston seniors group? I see a Prell White who needs to be with the Williston seniors group. That we do not. Got it. Okay. Prell, that's why. So I'm not sure. Uh, this is this is Richter from Williston Seniors. We don't need a chat room. We're like six feet okay. apart. So thank you. Okay. You do it the old fashioned way. Yeah. All right. Anybody else on here who's not, you know, six feet or or, or more from there? Uh, not close enough to hear the people they're supposed to be in a group with. All right. Hillary, I think you did it. Thank you. Thank you. You are quite welcome. All right. We'll be back at 10 of.
All right, welcome back. Hopefully everybody is, let me see, we see people coming back in from the breakout rooms. Thank you. Hope you all were able to spend time with your teams and able to talk about what you're learning here, what it means for your daily operations, start to build out your work plan um, and get you some ideas about how to both assist people in getting eligible for services and also how to make sure they get those quality services delivered to them. All right. And Bruce, uh, next, maybe move to the next slide. Just got a couple more minutes left. So just a couple of questions for your team to think about as we move this forward. Think about who you're serving using other funds that you might be eligible for 1915i services. I know last week, Monica said, there's a lot of shift in North Dakota from grant services to Medicaid funded services. Where are your grants either been lessons that they're going away, that some of these 1915i services could really fill those gaps to make sure that people get what they need. So think about that in sort of a broad general terms and then think about, Okay, then what do we need? To, if we find that opportunity here, you know, where do we need to work on provider enrollment? Where do we need to work on eligibility? How do we track enrollment? A lot of agencies that do grant funded services never track Medicaid eligibility. In some ways, they don't have to, they still get paid for those services. But everybody needs continuous coverage. Um, we've got a couple of um, how can you expand and serve more people now that the funds could, those other flexible funds you've got as well. Um, Sarah, you want to come off mute for some of your questions because we're getting to a question period here. I sure can. Um, so the YWCA just had a couple of questions after our breakout session. Um, we are interested in um, becoming a 1915i provider because it expands on services that we're already doing. Um, so with that being said, do we need to be open to referrals from um, anywhere or can we exclusively serve clients that are just in our programming. And then the second part of my question would be when um, our client's time is done in our programming, what does that look like for the continuation of 1915 services? Sure. So yes, this is a real shift for agencies that are used to more of a grants-based model that are used to more of a HUD and homeless services model. So one, you can't limit yourself and say, we're only going to serve you know, the individuals we have. You may have an X number of slots. You may have a certain number of capacity. You can only serve so many people. You only have so many staff, et cetera. You may try to move all the people you're with in that, but you can't do that. You have, but you can't just say, we're just serving people who are going through our program. You have to be, as you have capacity, open to taking referrals from outside sources as well. This is also why I think it's really helpful for you to know who the care coordination agencies are in your community, because you want them to know, you know, here's what you specialize, here's additional services that you offer, et cetera, beyond the eye. You know, here's really kind of the ideal person for you to serve, but they're also trying to get, you know, referral possibilities in all sorts of places. So really think about how do you, you know, how to use these resources and new funds in order to expand some of that. So oh, can I just expand on that a little bit? Um, Absolutely. I hope that's Monica's voice. I can't see it yeah, yet. Yeah, Great. it is. So with that being said, um, all providers have a choice whether or not to serve someone. Um, we, we are going to be changing how our um, provider enrolled provider list looks on our website. And it's actually going to pull from provider enrollment versus me managing it myself. Um, when I was managing it myself, I was able to indicate only serving individuals with substance use disorder or only serving individuals living at XYZ. That's going to pull from everybody now. So if you're enrolled to provide, say, housing support or care coordination or whatever it is for someone, you will show up on the list. But what? But it'll be up to the providers to determine whether they want to serve someone or not. So you're going to receive that that um, you know, reach out from either Jennifer and the person or just them or however they're gonna come to you. Um, and you can say yes or no to serving them. And if you're, you know, and we ask for a reason for the denial and um, on that form that you return to the state and on that form, you can certainly indicate only serving individuals living in our transitional housing or whatever it is that you so you you absolutely don't you'll be while you'll be open to referrals and you'll show up on our list you can narrow down who you accept to serve if that makes sense 
Yeah. And, and going forward, that's, I don't know when we're going to make that shift to that other, um, to that dashboard type thing with the interactive map of providers. Not sure when that's going to start. Um, but yeah, certainly it's always up to the provider to determine whether or not they want to serve someone. Yeah. And Monica, do you want to also take about, I can tell you what I think about it from a Medicaid frame, but you know, if somebody's done in a housing program, you know, from a Medicaid perspective, it doesn't mean they're done with needing the services. Services usually continue as long yeah. as they are medically necessary, but there also may be a transfer of services to a, you know, in the yeah. neighborhood where you're in now. They may not live with you anymore. They may live, across, you know, they may live in a different county and want a different service provider, you know, a different yeah. closer service provider. There's absolutely a lot of flexibility there. Yeah, no, definitely. I would recommend that, you know, you just help that person transition, you know, let them know that, you, hey, awesome, you're making this transition into a more independent setting. You know, we want to reduce your reliance on us. We want to get you connected with a, a broader community provider. So let's take a look at who else is providing housing services in the area and help you choose, you know, and then we can reach out to them and ask to transfer your housing support to that agency. Yep. Good questions. We're almost at the end of our time together. So any other questions? <laughs> so just let folks know we have our uh, Q&A on participant enrollment. That's this Friday afternoon from three to four central time. Um, totally voluntary. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night tonight, tomorrow night, you got a question you couldn't answer, you couldn't ask now because you didn't think of it now. That's what that session is for. Um, and then when we're going to come back next Wednesday, the 17th, noon to two, um, and talk about staffing, budgeting, and revenue projections, thinking about your budgeting and your fiscal management in a very different way than you may have had from a grant space perspective. So we need for that session, we need your executive, your decision maker, as Ambrosia said, your program lead, and particularly your fiscal lead, because a lot of this is the fiscal planning that falls on them. They're going to have new information and new, but also new, new questions they need to ask your agency and ask your staff. So we're going to talk about time studies. We're going to talk about services budget tools, some of my favorite topics. Um, so yeah. Any other last minute questions? Monica, anything else we wanted to see covered, mentioned? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you for your awesome work and have a great week. We will see some of you on Friday and I hope all of you, um, Executive Program and Fiscal on next Wednesday. Have a great time.